Okay, just want to let you know, Doug is um, trying a different computer to see if he can get in. Um, just having a little hang up on his end. It's asking for a password. I don't know why. Um, and let me see. Let me see. Okay, is my camera on? Good. Okay, good. Uh, so we should be able to start pretty soon. Hopefully, Doug will be able to get on uh, a different computer. But we could go ahead and start without him if if you want like. Why don't okay. we do that? All right. That sounds that if that works for everyone. Uh, hello, bienvenidos a todos. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Gruzer. I'll be the moderator for uh, the moment. Um, Doug may take over once he gets on, um, but welcome. So you are all logged in to Critical Media Literacy, Transforming Higher Education and Radical Democracy. And we have our presenters. Uh, there's going to be some bios uh, put into the chat. Um, and we can uh, look over them, but our presenters for this uh, segment are Douglas Kellner, Jeff Scher, Rosalind Satchel, and Stephen Gennaro. And uh, those buyers are gonna be forthcoming. Um, so I will hand it over to, ah, here we go. So Jeff Scher is from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, uh, from the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. Rosalind is from the University of California, Los Angeles, from the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies as well. And we have uh, Doug and Steve coming up. So correction, uh, Rosalind is from the University of California Graduate School of, of Education and Information Studies. And if you want, we could just introduce ourselves. That'd be fine. Okay. So Rosalind, how about if you start? <laughs> All righty, sure thing. I'm Rosalind Satchel. I'm um, the Blanche Seaver Professor of Communication at Pepperdine University. I'm also a faculty associate at Harvard Law School's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. In the coming year, I am uh, taking on the role of lead researcher at Kennesaw State University's Radau Institute for Social Equity. And one of the, I think, real benefits of my scholarship is that I do center the use of critical media literacy as a part of my practice of critical race theory and as well as a, a number of other uh, modalities I operate in. One of the benefits I've had in working with Doug Kellner um, thus far is that we've had an opportunity to really think about how we transform higher education for radical democracy. How do we ensure that the voices of those that are often muted and marginalized are centered? And one of the benefits that I've uh, been able to experience in using critical media literacy in the classroom, not only during my time at Pepperdine, but also out in communities, I've had a long career as a community organizer before entering the academy. And one of the things that has been most exciting is being able to practice a modality that is truly bottom up. Um, we have been able to use critical media literacy as an organizing tool in communities, as well as on campuses, that have really allowed for our audiences to set the agenda. 
So one of the exciting things that I do in, in using critical media literacy in the classroom is that I provide a space for my students who often have no or very limited exposure to critical thought. Um, I, I give them a, a laboratory space where literally we are using an inverted pedagogy inspired by Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire and really having an opportunity to engage what Stuart Hall called this um, negotiation of the code, right? Negotiating the hegemonic code. And I encourage my students in that space, not only to resist um, or accept, but also to critique and to challenge and to talk back. And that has been absolutely life-giving particularly on a campus that sometimes has been called conservative, where critical theory is frowned upon and often pushed out of the dominant discourse. So being able to use uh, critical media literacy to question and interrogate the dominant media systems, not just the content, but also the content creators and also the systems of political economy that inform them. We are able to use the five questions often to do a process that I call real bottom up organizing. So we're taking CML questions and really forcing the content creators, forcing the representations, forcing the very hegemonic code to defend itself. It's almost as though we, we can back them all up in the corner and shake the, the truth out of them. And the joy is in seeing the students embrace that process because they have the questions organically. They come with the questions, they come with the challenge and simply giving them a space and a language and particularly the tools embodied in those five questions to just take it all apart has really enlivened the discourse on our campus. We have had um, tremendous turnabout in terms of cultural competence as a standard. Um, we've of course had, and you've probably heard about in the news, the retaliation and pushback against critical race theory on our campus in large part because we have been so effective, because we have been so powerful in actually taking these Freerian concepts of empowerment and critical consciousness to pop culture and not being afraid to interrogate them until these issues of race, class, gender, sex, ability, and we do literally go through sometimes spending two to three weeks on each topic area and comb through representations of those who are differently abled. We comb through representations of those who are expressing themselves in terms of sexual orientation, um, in ways that are outside of the dominant culture, in all ways in which we see groups marginalized, even in terms of religion on this so-called Christian university campus, we have been able to actually create a space where our Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, atheist, and agnostic students also can engage in a pluralistic exchange about the religious representations and exclusions um, that we see in our media systems and in our media content. So the ways in which um, I've been able to really utilize the framework have, I think, allowed for us to see education as a tool for social justice, human rights, 
and liberation. It enables my students to deal critically and creatively with reality. Um, instead of seeing content on social media or even in mainstream media and outright rejecting it, they are dealing with it reflexively, engaging in a praxis that allows for them to make mistakes and have disagreements and make it all a part of a, an atmosphere where regardless of their prior knowledge or prior education or prior privilege, we can establish a framework for approaching topics from a leveled space where everybody is, is given access and opportunity to critique and understand and challenge and resist and even oppose contexts um, that are troubling to their particular context and population. So instead of just focusing on multicultural awareness or just um, doing some sort of for first order change in, in the students where they're just doing some superficial concern or understanding. What I've been able to do as a part of what I, I really attempt in, in, in achieving this critical consciousness with my students is that, that they have an opportunity to really break with discordant practices. So they can challenge and change the system by actually constructing a new world, imagining a new world. Literally by the end of the semester, they will have not only deconstructed popular media, but they will construct a product and then present that as a, a, a response or as a, a challenge to the system, how we can do better, how we can actually be about the liberation of those who are most oppressed in our world. So I'll stop there in the interest of time, just to kind of give you a, a little introduction into how I have been inspired by Paula Freire in the classroom and using critical media literacy to actually achieve some of our common objectives. Uh, thank, thanks, Roslyn, for, for sharing all of that wonderful uh, information. I think uh, I'll go next. Uh, if I'm, I'm Steve Gennaro and I'm at uh, York University in Toronto, Canada. Um, one of the founding members of the Children, Childhood, and Youth Studies program there. And I've been doing uh, critical youth studies for uh, close to two decades, um, inspired, obviously, by, uh, you know, the work of uh, Douglas Kelder, uh, but also by, uh, by Shirley, uh, who, who spoke earlier this evening as well. So two great uh, mentors of mine. So very uh, grateful to be able to uh, contribute <laughs> at a at an event where they are both speaking. And of course, because of that, I'm, all, my work is also heavily influenced by, by Paulo Freire as well. Now, my work uh, is also based in activism, uh, just like uh, Dr. Satchel's as well. Uh, I am a children's rights activist and a child and youth rights activist. And what that means is, uh, you know, my focus is on the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, which was drafted in 1989 and, uh, you know, is, is uh, implemented uh, across almost every single country in the world. <laughs> every single country in the world has signed and ratified it, actually, except for the United States of America is the only country to sign but not ratify uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, and critical media literacy is actually a fundamental human right, I believe, and one that belongs in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And uh, more recently, my work with young people in social media and digital media has really been taking on this task of working to update the UNCRC uh, in its, it, it, to reflect the lives of young people today as they express their, their needs and concerns to us as al allies who are listening and then using our privilege and power to amplify their voices. Now, the way that we go about doing this is we recognize that children's culture or youth culture culture is situated in a space that is overlapping with different types of media texts. 
So, and this is where critical media literacy comes in. We have inter, uh, intersecting overlapping texts. We have institutional voices about children. Okay, institutional voices about children. These are, uh, you know, largely um, policy. <laughs> and what they do is they uh, narrate what the lives of children are supposed to look like based on the hopes, the goals, the needs, the fears, the ambitions of a, of, of a social moment. So it's time and space dependent. We also have institutional voices um, you know, for children, and this is popular culture media, where those ideas about the cultural construct of young people's lives get passed on to, to children themselves. So they consume it in movies, in books, in video games, in whatever type of media they're engaging with, okay? And the, the world gets explained to them, okay? It gets explained to them about what their role is, where they belong, where they can fit in, where they can are, are supposed to see themselves. But there also exists another space, and that's children's own voices themselves or young people's own voices. And these are awesome, off, often subversive voices, and they often emerge through play. And this is where my work situates itself in Article 31 of the UNCRC, that every young person, every child has the right to play. And through play, young people have the opportunity to hear the stories that are told to them and then find themselves in those stories. And when they're not found in those stories, or when they're found in ways which do not, you know, um, you know, sync up with the type of lives that they want to live in a rights-based way, they need the opportunity to speak back. So critical media literacy is about providing the tools and the framework to engage for young people to engage with the media text that tell them where they belong and where they can fit in in the world around them, and then having the ability to speak back to that, all right, to speak a true word uh, to the world, to name the word, to name the world, to participate and be active in their own uh, lives lives as co-constructors of the world in which they live in. So very interested in these overlapping spaces. You'll hear me use words like children and young people almost as if they're the same. The UNCRC defines children as anyone under the age of 18. But UNICEF, which is the governing body that oversees the UNCRC uh, for uh, the United Nations, they actually define youth as 16 to 24, or 16 to 26. So we have overlapping spaces here. And really, the, the work in, in higher education li links up with that youth definition. Okay, so we're talking, and, and, and so there's some work right now in the field to extend the UNCRC and the rights of the UNCRC to all young people. This is not about the idea of per the per perpetual adolescence, which I wrote about two decades ago with, with, uh, with Douglas Kellner. This is more about the idea of the extension of basic human rights and fundamental human rights. And so we're looking from a rights-based approach to ensure that the voices of young people continue to be heard, especially as the institutional control of their lives continues to expand greater and greater and longer and longer. So higher education is the perfect um, battleground, all right, or, or, or space where we can have these engaged discussions. For one, for one reason for young people is it's a safe space for young people. You know, when they enter onto uh, campuses, when they enter into classrooms, Largely, these are spaces where young people are not met with physical violence for sharing their, their own ideas and their opinions. So if we have, a, you know, if we have a, a safe space for interaction and engagement, that's an excellent opportunity for young people. Uh, also, we have large numbers of young people present in these spaces as well, where they can congregate safely. We know that according to the UNCRC, Article 15 says young people should have the ability to set up, join groups, organizations, meet with others. Uh, and, and so the, uh, you know, the campus uh, and higher education is a great opportunity for that. It also is supposed to be, uh, again, engaging for Article 13, that young people can share their thoughts freely with others, learn, think, feel in any form of expression that works for them, not just in written word or spoken word, but in all types of media and media production. And, uh, you know, and Dr. Sato gave us several excellent examples in, in the curriculum within her classrooms where we see this being acted out in real life and in real time. And I know from having, you know, uh, read the work of, of, uh, of, of Jeff Sher, who's going to speak next, that this is something that's been going on in classrooms, uh, not just in uh, Los Angeles, California, but, uh, but, but around, around the globe from K all the way up to, uh, you know, higher edu education. They need to share their thoughts freely, Article 13. They need to be able to have a freedom of thought, Article 14. There needs to be a respect for children's views and young people's views, which is Article 12. All of this can happen within the campus. So this, so higher education is the battleground where we can do this if we create 
curriculum and pedagogy that is engaging, uh, that is open, that is collaborative, where the students and the young people are co-constructors, where we allow this to be a platform for their voice. And in my work, that happens again by engaging Article 31, which is the right to play. So using play as a tool, okay, within our curriculum to create media and to speak back to dominant norms. Play by its very nature is subversive. Play by its very nature exists outside of the complete supervision of adults, the complete supervision of institutions, the complete supervision of our governments. That's what makes it playful. And so we want to engage that Article 31. And in the work that I do with young people, they share their playful experiences and they use their, their play as a tool. And when we do this by engaging with the media around us, and then by taking that media on and then reconstructing it in a way that allows us to have voice. And in particular today for young people, that's happening as we know through social media, where 90% of young people in America uh, say that they have access to a smartphone and more than three quarters of them say that they are on constantly multiple times a day, according to the most recent Pew research on that as well. So in these social, uh, social networks, using social media platforms, this is where the play is happening. But what we wanna to start to do in the classrooms and what I try to do in my classrooms and I encourage you to do in higher education is to bring those social networks into the classroom. Let, let the young people bring their phones into the classroom, ask them to create projects to, you know, that, that where their, their projects are posting and using their social network spaces to engage with others, both on the campus around them and outside of the campus as well. Let's use the, top, the tools that we have now to create media to be tools of expression for young people's voices and higher education is a great spot where we can bring that all together and then and then push it forward. Uh, thank you. I'll pass it on to, uh, to, to Jeff Scher. Great. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. This is fab fabulous. I think I wanted to start by saying uh, one of the things that the three of us have in common is that we've all been greatly influenced by Doug Kellner and his work. And one of the things I think he's been very key in is really kind of helping us define and really think through what is critical media literacy versus just other types of media literacy, media education. And while this is not the same in every country, because there are many countries who just refer to this work as critical, as media literacy, and it is very critical. Um, in the US, there's been so much neoliberal influences, the attacks on critical race theory, like was mentioned, ethnic studies, all of that, there's a lot of forces that are very much about watering down any type of criticality, any type of looks at power and ideology. Um, and I'm not saying that other people in the US who are doing media literacy are not doing critical work. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm trying to argue is that we need to name it, especially in the United States at this point, what about the work makes it critical? Where is that social justice, environmental justice uh, lens and pedagogy? So I wanna share just real briefly uh, a website with you. This is something that we've been working on at UCLA. Um, it's a library guide and I'll put the link in the chat as well. Let me drop the link in here right now. Um, but we, we've been trying to create a space with as much, um, oops, let's see, with as much resources uh, and, and tools for people to really kind of have the, possibility to engage in an inquiry democratic process with students looking at all sorts of different aspects of their lives and critical media literacy using critical media literacy as a lens. So on the left, you can see um, I have, um, we have different tabs of different issues, different topics. Uh, and right in the middle, we have that definition that was read today uh, that the steering committee of this, or, of this uh, conference worked on collaboratively to generate these ideas of that definition. And then here's a framework that Doug and I have been working on. And we, this is not something we invented. These are ideas that have come from many different places, many people. We can trace back to the Frankfurt School, the Birmingham School, uh, the fabulous work of the Canadians, the Australians. You know, people all around the world have been doing this and we've just tried to help tweak and move and shape the language and so if you click on this, it'll take you to the link and there you can download a copy of it. And we have a copy in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and uh, Chinese as well. Um, it, 
the idea is using questions as the tool, right? We have a theoretical lens. We look at semiotics, politics of representation, social constructivism, these important theoretical lenses that really help us understand and make sense of all communication and especially media that's around us because media is based on representations, things that are being represented, right? And so the framework that we're, we're using tries to shape and guide us as facilitators in the process working with students to be able to encourage them to be discovering on their own as we facilitate that process. We're not telling them what to think. We're acting more as that guide who helps them. What about this question? Have you asked this question? Who's missing? Who's not? Who's being hurt by this? Who's benefiting from this? So that we recognize that all media, all information is never neutral. It all has a bias. It's all shaped and is shaping us. And the more critical we can be and aware, the more likely we'll be able to make more informed decisions that support the things that we believe are right. And also bringing into this something that both um, Steve and Rosalind were mentioning, the importance of, of social justice and uh, consciousness. You know, Paulo Freire talked that word in Portuguese, consciencial. I can't pronounce it right, but it's about this critical consciousness that really is what we need to have any type of kind of transformative education. Otherwise, we're just simply reproducing society. So I'm going to pass it back now so that we can have a little more of a dialogue. Russell or Steve, either of you want to jump in and, um, or we could also take questions from the chat too. I'd be glad to engage some questions. I can go on all day about this stuff, but I I'd rather be involved in a, a dialogue. Cool. So if anybody has a question, either want to raise your hand or write it in the chat. Um, let's try to make the space a little bit more dialogical. So it's not just, you know, um, us fools on the hill talking at people. Well, I'll get us started. How about that? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say something controversial and piss people off. I love doing that. Um, so, one of the things that my students often uh, say at the end of a semester with me uh, is that they can see things now that they'd never seen before, but it's messed them up because now they can't really enjoy media the same way as they did before because they're asking different questions. And I'm just wondering, I mean, isn't that a good thing? I, I think it's a good thing. My students typically push back and say, nobody wants to go to the movies with me anymore or things like that. And I, I'm wondering how do we create uh, a, a sense that this is a good thing that like taking the blinders off is actually a good thing that, that our students and our communities um, can actually benefit from as an empowerment rather than a stripping. So I want to jump on that. Thank you, Rosalind. It was great. Uh, so I think the empowerment comes from the production. And when we encourage our students to create, to make their own media and do it through this critical lens where we're analyzing and then they're producing, like both of you had talked about, you know, about speaking back, about um, pushing back. This is their chance to have a voice. And I've done this with students as, you know, as young as kindergarten. And sometimes that's, you know, giving them an iPad and letting, having them take pictures of each other, learning from different camera angles or having them record a story and create a little podcast. There's so many ways today that's so easy with technology. You know, cell phones have just kind of exploded the potential for media production and in classrooms, even in some of the poorest classrooms I've been in, there's almost always at least somebody has got a cell phone. We, we do have the tools that digital divide is still real, but it's less. And we can be taking advantage of this and empowering our students, encouraging them to create, but to create critically. 
I, I would even push even more on that. I, I agree, but I would push even further. So one of the things that I've introduced into my classes over the last five years is every course that I teach, at some point in time, we do a unit where students have to complete an hour of code. And I, and I think that it's really important that they, that they do that. And there's lots of free, free sites where they can complete the hour of code online and they get a little certificate and they submit that to me. And then they give a, a video response about their experiences of going through coding. And then we line that up with you know, some of the real issues that are at play right now. So if we're talking about the production of media and we want our young people and our students to be involved in the production of media, well, where, where is that media heading, right? You know, Corey Doctorow the, always says, you know, if you, if you wanna be involved in, 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 in the dialogue, you have to be able to Code, teach kids to code is the most important thing we can do. And we know that there's a discrepancy right now in coding when it comes to gender and when it comes to, to race. So, you know, the, and this is, you know, STEM, degendering STEM and creating, uh, you know, racial equity in, in, in STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, mathematics, is really an important part to not just the present moment, but the, the future moment, and not just of education, but of our society. And I'll give you one quick example. Uh, um, again, going back to the United Nations, just in a, in a tweet that was put out by the United Nations uh, going back to March, they said back in March that, uh, you know, currently right now, uh, less than 10% of all the AI programming jobs that are out there are occupied by women of color. And what that means is that when AI technology is being created or it's being built, fundamentally, it's then representing the, the 90% of the, the, the white men coders who are creating that. So if, if an AI technology, the type of things that tell us what happens when we put into search engines, guess what we want to do, shape us and move us towards different websites or when we're on our social, our young people are on their social media, it's guiding them to the messages they see or they don't see. That's all fundamentally being shaped and shifted, okay, being created by white white male programmers. So we have to degender and you know, create racial equity in STEM itself if we want to also change the, the media production and the media messages. So speaking back, and I think coding are, are really heavily connected. And so I would encourage all of you in higher education to encourage your students, especially the ones who don't see themselves as coders. That's the biggest thing, right? Part of critical media literacy is about also engaging our, uh, our, our students and our young people to see themselves and their voice as, as mattering and, 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 and having the ability to tell their stories to encourage them to participate in those types of um, projects or, or movements as well. I, I really can't um, support what Steve said any more than I, than I really <laughs> could show you by jumping up and down right now. Um, I, I was honestly, I, I had that as one of my comments over here. So Steve, you you took my, my comment about what's happening in tech, right? And how it is that our critical media literacy has to expand to, um, I think, make sure that we're not being edged out of a critical digital literacy conversation, right? That there is a, a different conversation that's happening among our tech ethicist colleagues who are addressing some of those disparities in AI and in AI ethics, creation, algorithms, and so forth. What we, I think, have uniquely to offer um, the discussion that is emerging is the primacy of critical race theory in critical media literacy, right? So is that we have at our center been a, a, a body a area of thought that has understood the criticality of race and race um, as it's been practiced throughout structures and systems to exclude, right? So we're constantly dealing with a, 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 an ongoing um, tension where literally, I, I think I may have even read a comment in the, the chat about you know, who is and who is not allowed to be a content creator and who is and who is not allowed to decode that content. And ultimately, when we are having these conversations about traditional and legacy media, we have to acknowledge that that conversation is opening up in a tech industry that many of us don't fully understand. And we truly have to understand in order to challenge the power grab that is occurring when we look at the fact that those 
um, folks who are behind the algorithm discrimination, um, the al algorithmic discrimination that's being used by police forces and other um, forms of criminal justice supervision, we've got to absolutely be a part of those conversations. And, and I think it's unique for us to be a part because that critical race theory component and its intersectionality, the lens of intersectionality being able to really come into those interlocking systems right at the place of need the greatest need where most people are being most marginalized. I, I, we've got to, I think, push back against these notions that exclude certain people from um, being a part of the critiquing and creating class. Yeah, and just going off that, I think, and you both mentioned it again, the, the notion of power, uh, that just needs to be a central part of all media education, the critique, the questioning, the challenging of power, because that's where the inequality comes from. It's these hierarchies of power that are reproducing the same structures of patriarchy, white supremacy, heteronormativity. These big ideologies are being reproduced through media all the time. And typically when it's done well through the media, it's invisible. We don't recognize it. And that's why our work as critical media guides as educators who are promoting this critical thinking, this, this whole mentality of, of just becoming more aware and questioning the world, ourselves in the world through a lens where we're asking who's benefiting, who's being hurt. We're building empathy, but we're doing it in a way through using critical media literacy as a pedagogical tool that ideally, hopefully is empowering and is engaging people empathetically with the world around them, knowing and, and asserting their voices as they matter, they can contribute, we can make these changes. We can't put this off on other people. This is something that's systemic and structural, and we need to be building these, these coalitions and, and ways of challenging the dominant ideologies. And, and Jeff, I just again, and I think um, adding to that, language matters. The language that we use matters. So all the things you're talking about there, the, you know, the words that, that, we, that we use to describe that, like ideology, like hegemony, like these types of words, we can't be, we can't shy away from using them. And part of what we're doing with critical media literacy with our students, hopefully, is giving them access to language to, to describe feelings that they've already had, experiences that they've already known. It's not that we're opening their eyes to the world around them in a way that they never saw it before. It's not like the matrix where we give them a pill or, you know, and all of a sudden they see the world that they've never seen before. It's that, uh, but it, there's a, there, there's already language that's out there to explain the feelings that they're having. So in some ways, what we're doing is we're building community with critical media literacy. We're saying there are others who have seen and felt the same way you do right now. And this is the way that in which we speak about it. And here's language with which you can speak about it. That feeling all right, of, of, that you're describing, that's implicit idea. Idea, ideology at play. That's an ideological state apparatus that is working it structurally to prevent you from having access to the same experiences maybe that others have. That type of you know um, structural white uh, supremacy it, it, that, that is built into the world in which you're living in, it exists. And so part of what we're doing at Critical Media Literacy is, again, like I said, we're, we're opening community to individuals who, who have had feelings and experiences, but may not may not have realized that there were others out there who felt that way already, and then allowing them uh, or, or, or inviting them to use the same language that we that we're, we've been using to describe it. And those words get used as dirty words against us, by the way, in, in mainstream media. When we, want to, when we want to speak with this language, it's like they, they want to take those words away from us. They want to say, you, you know, they want to, uh, they want to remove our ability to discourse on these topics and to share our opinions by labeling us as whatever words they want to use to, to disengage us and remove our power and to remove the power of that language. But again, critical media literacy, that last word matters to the literacy part. Words matter and they have power. And we want to keep the power in those words and we want to use those words to speak back against the power so one example that i do in terms of um in my critical media literacy class about challenging language and helping people recognize it so we talk about just the way language is being used right now in the media <clears throat> i'm sorry in the media 
in terms of climate change. The Guardian newspaper stopped using the term climate change. They only refer to it now as a climate emergency or a climate crisis. What does that mean if we simply change our language that way uh, in terms of what we're talking about? The severity of things will change. The severity of the way we respond to things will change. The actual um, activity is, 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 in cha is changing, is getting worse and worse. Um, and then another place we look is in terms of indigenous communities and indigenous languages. So many indigenous cultures have words that we don't even have in English or in Spanish or some of the col more col colonized languages that refer to reciprocity and respect and relationships with nature and the natural world. Language, you know, sets our mind. You know, how do you how do you do something if you can't name it and, and talk about it? And so, language is a very important part of critical media literacy. And language isn't just the words we use; it's also the, the visual language, the sound language, the multimodal language, all of those different languages. I dropped a bunch of questions in the chat box in case anybody didn't see. And that's just, the, that, that's a series of questions that I use as a handout I have. Um, questions to ask when exploring media and identity, the who benefits questions in the media who's. And again, a lot of that is, um, is also in the framework that Jeff was showing uh, earlier uh, that, that Jeff and Doug have put together as well in, in, their, in their latest book on critical media literacy. But it's really just about, again, asking critical questions, engaging our students, getting, uh, uh, giving them the tools to, to ask the questions themselves. You know about the again the ordinary everyday experiences that's where power is heavily situated in the most ordinary in the most mundane and that's where critical media literacy is is i think most needed right so the focus of the session is on looking at higher education. So it'd be interesting to hear what people have, what thoughts or questions they have, uh, you have about kind of this topic in higher ed, because all three of us, that's what we're doing. Alexandre, go ahead, ask your, oh, I'm sorry, Andrea, do you have a question? No, Alexandre. I see. Go Hi. Uh, do, do you prefer me to write the question, guys, or should I say it? Go ahead and ask. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Alexandre. I'm from the Federal University of Rio. Uh, thanks for, for, for the event and congratulations. This is a very important initiative. Um, I work in the postgraduate department in communication at the university, and one of the key issues we have been concerned with in the past few years in, in teaching uh, media literacy for higher ed students, especially undergrads, is having a special focus on the political economy of communication and trying to pinpoint for example, the economic origins of some media organizations, their ties to corporations. Uh, what is the weight these issues have, in your opinion, or what weight should these issues should these issues have in a curriculum focused on media literacy for higher ed? Do you think this is an important part of it? Um, I would really like to know your opinion about it. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I must say, I, I jumped at this one because um, this is my stuff, right? I, I really think that unless we do the, the systems analysis and actually talk about media ownership and actually discuss how the policies have been rolled back, um, how you know the fairness doctrine really doesn't exist anymore and why right i mean like those are the the larger i think structural conversations that are absolutely essential to have being able to help our students to understand the the history of media monopolies and understand that there have been um significant um, commissions and studies and all kinds of uh, opportunities throughout history to challenge um, a lot of the media monopolization that we see and yet and still 
we have a, a problem with lobbyists. Um, we bring in, um, I bring in Jack Abramoff and the whole lobbying scandal, because I, I think it's important for the students to understand how media works. And so, Alexandre, my, my reasoning for, for jumping at this is because I literally start my semester, I start the curriculum with a systems analysis so that they understand exactly the Hutchins Commission of 47 is a really important part of it too, but I, I take them as far back as the Klansmen, you know, the, the original name of Birth of a Nation. And we start there and we start at white supremacy being the origin of this medium of Hollywood film. And only once they get that part can they truly start to understand how this plays out in terms of vertical and horizontal integration. You know, I literally, I bring in um, Marlon Riggs' old film about um, ethnic notions. Um, it's literally titled Ethnic Notions. And in that book, I mean, in that film, we get a chance to see the connection between the nursery rhymes and the publishing industries and the media and the advertising, and we deconstruct all of it. And it's really, I think, a really important part of the curriculum because it's not just race for race sake. It's not watching lynchings just for shock value or dealing with a, a, a participation or complaint complicity with Black trauma as entertainment. Instead, what we, we do is talk about it in terms of vertical and horizontal integration, right? So we get a chance to talk about the publishing industry being connected to the amusement parks and to the movies and the TV shows and the toys that our kids play with and how that whole merchandising process becomes a really important part of the social conditioning and the social constructions um, that, that marginalize among us. So I, I think that it's an important part of the curriculum. I don't think we can really do the um, proper analysis of representation um, if we are not talking about the policies, the systems and structures um, and, and how these institutions operate to exclude certain voices. And, and yeah, when I do child and youth studies, I go back to Locke and Rousseau, <laughs> like, you know, theory matters, right? And an intersectional approach of any kind is going to tell us that we, we, we want to also be recognizing the economic base that's underpinning some of the things that we're looking at in the class studies as well. And the reason why I do Locke and Rousseau is because Locke and Rousseau, in addition to being, to being two fundamental theorists in terms of democracy, are also two fundamental theorists in our, you know, current construction and understanding of what it means to be a child, right? Some thoughts concerning, uh, uh, concerning education by Locke and a meal by Rousseau or two of the most fundamental texts of shaping the Western notion of how to raise children at the same time. So we're syncing up childhood with democracy. And anytime we're talking about the history of democracy, we're also lining it up with the history of capitalism. And this is important to look at the, the current moment always through, the, through these lenses and recognizing that there is there is a there is a connection between not the the um, the economics and the decision making process, right? And when we, and I'm interested in rights, and when we're interested in in rights, we're talking about allowing uh, more individuals to be active participants in the decision making process, especially when the decisions have real consequences on their lives. And so the economics of that is very important. And so political economy, therefore, is very important because we have to know, you know, um, you know, to, to go like to, to Hamilton for a second, right? Right? We, we want to be in the room where it happens. And to be in the room where it happens, you need to have uh, an understanding of the economic base where decisions get made. So political economy is extremely important. See, uh, Claudia, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? I mean, I, I think it's good. Uh, to have conservative students in the classroom to have those discussions with for two reasons. One, because, I mean, we want to have a space where we can have critically engaged dialogue with 
uh, other individuals. So if it's happening in in our in our classrooms, then that's that's a that's a, a, a I think again like a safe space for dialogue, and and so that's. I think powerful because it gives us an opportunity where people, all people, regardless of their opinions, can share them and we can have uh, a, a discussion. At, at the same time, I think it's also important that we continue to engage and to ask questions and to not be um, not be intimidated by by individuals who who disagree with us. And, and again, uh, what I'm interested in is having as much dialogue as possible. So when my students say, no, I disagree, I mean, I, that's always an exciting moment for me because it means we get to have a discussion, a respectful discussion, and we can build from there. And, you know, and, and we have the whole year to continue this discussion. We don't have to solve the problem in one, in one lecture, in one seminar. We have the whole year to have this discussion. And what we want, for, I mean, what I would argue, what we want in higher education is to be able to have as many of these discussions as possible. So that way, um, you know, like I said, that this this is the ground, the 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 base where where, where this this can happen. Uh, we don't want to close out their, their opinions and we don't want them to not take our classes and we don't want them to only congregate in other spaces. We actually want to invite them into the discussion and and and, and have that as, as, as a space to to engage. That's what I would that's how what I would recommend. Yeah, I agree, Steve. I'd I'd, I'd add that I I always start from a, a positive space. I, I do. I go in thinking we all agree that people shouldn't suffer. And I start there. And I start talking about human suffering. And I don't start with theory. I don't start um, with what's wrong even. I, I, just, I just start with the human condition, I, I, I will really use ethnic notions to help garner compassion and empathy. And I feel like once we can tap into a common place of love, generally we can have a conversation even if we disagree. Um, at least in my classes, you know, I set up all times, all types of guides and and ethical mandates, you know, they are required to respect difference and um, engage respectfully and have civil dialogue and silence, civil difference and all of that. I haven't, honestly, because of the ethos that I really work hard to create, um, I haven't had a real problem because the students become the, the police of the ethos. They protect each other and protect um, a, a general sense of, of justice um, that is nonpartisan. And uh, every once in a while, there'll be somebody that'll come in and try to mess that up. But honestly, it's the students that check them every time. And I, I appreciate not having to be that person. Um, but once we start with the human suffering and the, the human condition, I think a lot of the other mess um, falls aside, uh, at least until it doesn't. And then I try to bring us back. And I just want to add on to that because I, I have a very similar approach. And, and I think, you know, as much as we want to be talking about semiotics and all these other very important pieces, we also have to start with basically building a community. And so one of the things that I do with my students in the very beginning of any media literacy class is we build community. We work, we do different activities, throwing balls around or whatever it is, trying to start connecting with each other because this is really about how we relate to each other, right? This is about social justice, empathy, all of these, these really important things. So things like class agreements, a building community and creating not just a safe space, but a brave space where we can trust each other to be able to then engage and take on these huge um, issues like white supremacy and patriarchy. Um, we're almost out of time. We still, we've got one hand up. Let's, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Yuya Peko Takeda. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, I appreciate the uh, the way uh, this conversation is evolving, and um, I appreciate your comment about the uh, creating uh, safe space and um, using uh, the students' voice that are opposed to yours as a um, um, as a, a chance for dialogue. Um, my question is: um, if you ever encountered a situation where 
the, the students' um, opinions have this kind of performative effect of uh, suppressing or eroding a space for free um, dialogue. Um, by that, I mean, if they, their uh, stance contains um, some oppressive um, elements that are harmful for some other students in classrooms, um, would you, what, what, um, I, I wonder what uh, we should do as uh, educators. Thank you. Yeah, I've definitely, and I think probably all of us have had that experience. Those are difficult conversations, but they need to be addressed. And the mistake is trying to not address it, just saying, oh, you know, he didn't mean that, just let's just move on, or I don't, I don't know about that. Um, sure, I've had students post things online or say things in the in the classroom that were not, some of them were just simply microaggressions, other were macroaggressions. And I think our role as, a, as an educator, as a facilitator, is not to allow that to just slip by, is to confront that and say, let's talk about that. Uh, we, we've got to be willing to confront and through a loving way where we're not using, you know, shaming or, or um, you know, a cancel culture, any of that, but where we're engaging because that's what higher education's got to be. It's got to be that brave space where we can do that. We can make mistakes. And I start every, I start every semester or every quarter telling them, I'm going to make a ton of mistakes. I, that's how we're going to learn. You are too. We've got to be open to forgive each other and engage together to support each other because we're all in this together. Agreed. Totally. And I think accountability is absolutely essential. I just want to underscore that point, making sure that when things are happened, are happening and when things are said inappropriately that we deal with it as soon as possible. I mean, and for me, that's often been on the spot because if they get to say something inappropriate on the spot and then have a quiet, you know, oh, come to my office and have a conversation, then the class doesn't get the benefit of that accountability. And so I have, I have, done a few things. One, I've put students out of my class. Um, and I also have in, in an effort to not do the putting people out thing too much. Um, that was only in one instance and it was necessary because the, the student was actually being totally inappropriate to another student. Um, but in, in most situations, I've had an opportunity to say, okay, I have a problem with that statement. Let me give some room to those of you in the room who may need to say something back to him or her. And that way I've said, I don't like what just happened, but I'm not the one taking control or being the punisher. I'm instead inviting the students to hold um, each other accountable. And usually that, re that results in the other student correcting themselves. Oh, you're right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. But I've only had one instance where I had to put a student out. It, and um, that, that's a, a great way to handle it actually, I think too, and, and very Ferrarian as well too. And, and, and also the notion that we don't wanna be the, the person who holds all the answers in our, in our classrooms. Well, one thing that I've done that I think has helped with this over the last couple of years is every week at the end of the class, I leave my students with a question, right? And the question is very personal. And then I ask them to reflect on that question. And if they feel up to it, write a response and submit it, you know, and just for me to read for nobody else. And they just, they, it just goes towards their participation grade. If I don't grade their responses and like, this is a good response, this is a bad response. It's just throughout the year, I'm going to ask you a question every week. It's going to be a little bit personal and you can reflect on it and write whatever you want to write. And if you say, I don't want to talk about this, I don't like this, Dr. G, I'm okay with that. That, that still counts as participation, right? And what I found is by doing that and by reading those every single week and by responding to, 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 to them, it allows me to, 
to, to, to have, participate in some of those uh, in some of those moments that aren't necessarily in a public forum. So the student who is having these challenging um, questions about some of the things that we're talking about and, and has these and, and, and now feels conflict between maybe what they've grown up with culturally, religiously, personally, familially, whatever it may be, and now that's being all contested in, in the classroom, they have a safe space where they too can share their feelings and their ideas, and then we can engage in a little bit of a discussion with it. So that way, the first time they come to the class to share those ideas is maybe in a more public forum, they've had an opportunity to kind of in a more nuanced way talk through some of those. And so that can also be helpful. We can listen, just because we have a big lecture hall of like 100 or 200 or 500 people or a classroom of 30 or 35 or 50 people doesn't mean we can't still have individual conversations with all of our students as individual people, right? And be compassionate individuals engaging with them too. So, I mean, there's, there, we, we can continue to build lots of different pathways for dialogue with our students. And, oh, sorry. And then, so if someone says something really challenging in class, I might say, hey, you know what? Let's make that the starting point for this week's question. So this week's question is let's reflect on that. And everyone can have a chance to share their opinion on it. And I'll, you know, I'll, I mean, and, 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 that, and that's a safe way for everyone also to share their, their feelings back. That's the, the tie back. There you go. Yeah. All right. I'm looking at the clock and we're already over time. Uh, this has been great. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, please stick around Saturday and Sunday. There's sessions all day going Saturday and Sunday. It's all online, all for free. Uh, it, we're so happy to have you with us. Thank you very, very much to everybody.